Good morning, friends and family of Central. I'm so glad that you are joining us for worship today. I want to invite you to stand as we sing. We're going to begin our time of worship together by singing these age-old words about the authority, the goodness of God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit who is worthy of praise both in heaven and on earth. So let's just step into this moment to honor God with our worship, with our hearts, with our soul, mind, strength, everything in us for his glory. Can we do that? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. you 
we begin to sing this next song, I just want to take a chance to say that one thing that I know to be true 
believe that worship can be one of our greatest weapons in the sort of adversities and disappointments that we face. That's why we say things like, I will praise you from the morning until the evening. I will praise your name forever. There is something to the power of worship, but worship can take on a, a lot of different forms. Worship looks like prayer. Worship looks like praise. Worship looks like singing. Worship is certainly intentionally spending time in the presence of the living God. And we're about to step into a moment where we're going to be calling on the power of the name of Jesus. And maybe, maybe today you find yourself hurting for somebody who does not yet know the power of the name of Jesus over their life and you want to intercede for them in your worship at this time. But maybe there's also a chance that that person could be you, that you're not entirely sure that God can make a way for you in what it is that you're facing. But I just want you to know, I just want you to know that I have seen and I know the power of the name of Jesus. And he is a caring God who listens and loves his children. And there is nothing that is impossible for him. And so we're going to declare the name of Jesus in this place. We're going to claim the authority that Jesus has over all things in this place. In your life, if you are not in this room, it still applies to you. Christ has authority over all things. So we're just going to take on this posture of prayer and worship before God. We're going to use this as our weapon to call on the holy name of Jesus to make a difference in us and around us today.
shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, we speak Jesus. We are so thankful. We are having church. That was fabulous. We're just going to turn all the lights off. And... Perfect. Have a seat. I love that song. And Hannah, I just want to do, she, they, they hate this. I mean, this is such a Jesus moment, and then we thank the worship team, but I have to. I have to thank the team. I want to thank Hannah for this. Hannah, I love you. I love your voice. I love your courage. I love what you're speaking for us. It's a gift that we have. So we are so thankful for that. So welcome everyone to Central. Um, if you're new here, I do want to say, I do want to invite you. We have a Discover Central lunch right after this service. Just go up to the information desk and they can tell you where that is. If you're a guest and would like to check out more about who we are, be sure to check that out. That's a, a, a great thing for you to do. So we are, I want to welcome also people online. Um, I love that. My mom, I just want you to know my mom watches every week online. She's 96, 
Hey, Mom. So I'm so thankful for technology. It's so great. Hey, we are in a series called Verses. So we've been in about three weeks now. This is the fourth week. And it's been really, really exciting. So much that we decided to add a week to November 6th. We've added that week to continue this series, and we're going to have a panel up here. Well, first, let me tell you about the next three weeks, and then I'll tell you about November 6th. So the next three weeks, Craig is doing all the teaching because no one else wants to do these topics. So here they are. Church versus state. <laughs> week two, that's next week. Next, the, after that, life versus choice. And after that, clarity versus concern, which is on sexual identity. These are things we're talking about a lot right now. And I'm thankful we're having the conversation here. So we're going to have that conversation. But what we want to do now is to invite you to engage in this and to email us any questions you may have to versus, VS, versus at centralholland.org. Go ahead and start. And then November 6th, we're going to have a panel up here, and we are going to take in questions, and questions that you've, that you've emailed in and um, that will be interesting. I love those kind of services. And then Craig and, and Corey will be answering those questions. So panel and do your questions, all of that kind of thing. This today, Corey Castle is back. We're so happy to have him. He is doing old school versus, well, we're gonna start, yeah, old school versus new school. This will be so interesting. It gets very interesting when you become a part, you're, you're finding yourself in the old school. When did that happen? I don't know. But I'll tell you a couple things. When it comes to music, I'm very, very in love with the new school stuff. That last song, those lyrics, we have God is just breathing life into so many artists writing these great songs. So I'm definitely new school in the, in the uh, worship music, except when it comes to Christmas. You cannot take my old school Christmas away. It, uh, get that? It's the Andy Williams, Perry Como, Amy Grant, Christmas, Christmas. I don't know, it just make, it just warms my heart. There's something about Christmas. So it is interesting, old school versus new school. That's just music. There's so many other areas in life. So I've been teasing with Lynn. He says he's old school all the way, old school, old school. So this is what I asked him. Do you still have a checkbook? I am so old school, we still have a checkbook. Oh, no. <laughs> we never use it, but I still got one. In case you don't know what it is, I'd be glad to show it to you. That's great. Anyways, Lynn has a couple of announcements for us. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Kim. Over the last month, we've been talking about something new around here. We've been talking about a vision goal. Simply put, God is given Central a vision to accomplish his work in the coming year. This vision is a very challenging vision in these difficult economic times. We need God's power working in among us if we're going to accomplish this. And we are confident that God will provide because God's work done in God's way will not lack God's supply. There's two components of this vision. One is general fund. Every ministry of this church is funded through general fund. We recently celebrated 93 lives changed, witnessed in baptism. More are coming this month. You're part of that when you give to general fund. I was in a meeting this last week and I was thrilled beyond description when I heard reports from student ministries. Not only their growth in numbers, but to hear story after story of students leading. These are not just our leaders of the future. They are leading now, and you're part of that with general fund giving. And I imagine that if Jesus were to come to our worship today, he would see us busy about many things. But I'm pretty confident he'd stop by children's ministry. The time to impact those impressionable minds is now. And when you give to General Fund, you're part of that. If you would come in entrance D this morning and look through the glass doors, you would see the chapel that has a flat floor. Pastor Craig has dreamed about that since the day he came. 
but actually leadership began to dream that back in 1999 as we made preparations to move from there to here. The dream of having a flexible space that could be used for lots of different setups, there is no doubt that will become the most critical space week after week used for many ministries. Celebrate recovery dreams of moving into that space. Every Monday night, so many people come. We pour out into overflow because there is not room for people in the main student center. It'll be a critical piece of that ministry. You're part of that when you contribute to the vision goal. We're asking all of you to be in prayer about what God wants you to do. But whatever else you hear today, we don't want anyone to give grudgingly or out of necessity because God loves a cheerful giver. We ask only one thing, pray. Pray and ask God what he would want you to give. Give by faith, not by sight and insert an element of sacrifice. If lots of us do those three things, it'll be enough. Thank you for being here. Please join me now as we go before the Lord and give to him the petitions that are in our hearts. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for tuning our hearts this morning, singing about Jesus. Jesus, the name that is above every name, that breaks down every barrier, that breaks every chain, that sets us free. We celebrate Jesus and thank you for being with us. We thank you for the faith that you have given to us. It helps us in good times as well as challenging times. We pray for Carrie O'Neill and, and Betsy Cook as they celebrate the homecoming of their dad and yet at the same time process the grief of saying goodbye to him. And we are conscious that many people throughout our congregation right now are in the throes of long-term illness or find themselves in a very challenging time physically. In this moment, may you indeed put your presence over them and they feel the strength of your spirit flowing over them. And Lord, you know better than any of us how troubled times we are in as a nation, as a world. We ask for your mercy that you would bring peace and revival and help to us at our point of need. As the elections begin to roll out, we ask, Lord, that you put into office by divine appointment those who will lead and do right. We pray for the peace of Ukraine. We pray for our churches there that we're supporting. We pray for that you will just supply their needs. And as the gospel is going forth, that many will come to know you as Lord and Savior. And then for this morning, as Pastor Corey comes to speak, one more time, Spirit of the God, fall fresh on him. May he speak your words with power and confidence and clarity. And give to all of us ears to hear what your spirit says to us and a heart that will obey. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's get ready to rumble! The feature event of the evening. The hard hitting and the undefeated. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. First, ladies and gentlemen, with a record of 29 wins, no losses. He has Well, good morning and welcome to Church Central. How are we feeling this morning? We awake? All right, I, got, I just got to stop and big up and shout out that. How amazing is our creative team? That was just fun, right? Can we give them one more round of applause? I said it in the first service. I had no idea Hannah played violin too. Everybody up here is so talented. They're amazing. That was fun, kind of showing a bit of that juxtaposition between old school and new school. And that is the title of my message today, Old School Versus New school. If you're new here, my name's Corey, one of the guys that gets to kind of serve and lead here at Central and, and our network family of churches around the world. And as you heard earlier, we're in a series called Verses. And the whole heart behind this series was there's so much controversy in our culture. There's so much uh, kind of backbiting and fighting and infighting in, in culture, in, in the government, in our country, and even in the church. We thought we would take a few weeks as a, as a faith family and hold up some of these most controversial topics and not talk about where do I land or Craig lands or where, do, where does the dom denomination land, but rather where does Scripture land on some of these topics. And let me just say this from the outside of this message. I said it in the first service as well, but anything we say up here, if you're a Christ follower, I would implore you to hold it up to Scripture yourself. And make sure everything that is said from a pulpit or platform, if you're going to base your life on it, that it aligns with God's word. Because that's what we're trying to get from all the wellsprings of life is coming from God's word. So just like that, yeah, amen. But I just say that like hopefully you can trust people up here and we study and we do our research. But, but it's on you and it's on me to hold what we learn up to God's word and make our decisions for our personal lives. Amen. So we're just kind of talking about those things. And I know Kim just said it, but I want to reiterate it. Um, you know, we kicked off the series with secular versus sacred, sacred versus secular. And that was kind of like an, an outward look at, at, at how these two concepts really align and or don't align. If you missed it, I would encourage you to check that out. And then Pastor Craig took us week two. It was amazing. Dan, last week, this week, we're going old school versus new school. But then the next three weeks, you know, we're going to be diving even deeper and deeper into some of those cultural juxtapositions. And, and I really want to reiterate, if you have a question, email us. Like, let us know. Pastor Craig, myself, maybe a few others are going to be a panel. And these are some of my favorite Sundays when we just get a chance to dialogue as a church. So as you guys email in, we have a team that's going to curate those for kind of like the, the most asked questions or those that we can take a deeper dive on. And I think it's going to be a powerful way to round out this series. And then like Kim kind of alluded to, she mentioned Christmas. And I felt like we all were like, Christmas, yay. We got a, some big plans for Christmas. Get ready for that. But all that to say today... We're going to talk old school versus new school. I joked with Pastor Larry, um, who kind of oversees our 909 Classic Service, that I almost wore a suit today um, to preach in this message. And then he asked in front of the entire room, do you even own a suit, Corey? And I was offended by that because I have been to a funeral and a wedding. No, <laughs> I do have suits. But I, I thought about it and I was like, well, I don't want to confuse people and make them think that like, that's how I always dress. But I put on a jacket for you out of respect for the old school today. But that whole premise of, of old school versus new school, we just saw it illustrated so clearly with the worship team up here taking that old school hymn and, and just taking us straight to the throne room with the violin, then juxtaposing it with the electric guitar, a newer age instrument, and then we saw them come together. But it kind of begs the question, why is there a tension between old school and new school in the first place? Why is there a battleground found between tradition and innovation in our culture, in society, but especially in the church? Like, why is that? It gets real quiet in this time. This is going to be fun. Everybody take a deep breath. Inhale. Exhale. Hopefully you brush your teeth this morning. Person in front of you. Yeah. But like, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to kind of like maybe step on some nerves today, but it's with intention and it's with the right heart. But this whole tension between old school and new school, I think revolves around this idea of change. 
Because to say something was old and now new means it, it, it changed. And I don't know about you, but I found most humans, we have a hard time with change. Right? That's why some people sit in the same place every Sunday, even though there's not assigned seats in church. Right? It's just because we naturally like that. You know why I think we naturally gravitate towards sameness? It's because we serve a God that never changes. The Bible says in Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So God never changes our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I don't know about you, but that's refreshing to know that, like, I can always go back to something that's consistent and doesn't change. Like, that's just a good thing. But have you ever thought about how weird it is that God never changes but literally everything he created is always changing. Everything. The universe itself right now is expanding. Galaxies and solar systems are spinning and rotating and changing positions constantly. Even you and I sitting right here right now, your cells and molecules and atoms are in constant flux. None of us go unchanged. Even the Christian walk is one of change. Like when, when you come to Jesus, there's this Christianese word repentance. What that literally means is to change your mind. And then when you sign up for Christianity, there's this other Christianese word called sanctification, which means you daily change to follow Jesus and look more like him. To be a Christian and not like change is antithetical. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Christians should actually embrace change the most because that's what the Christian walk is. It's changing to look more like Jesus. So why? Why is change so hard? Today we're going to look at a passage of scripture where Jesus addresses this very topic. While when the church holds on to tradition, it begs the question, what traditions should we hold tightly to and which ones are we okay to let go of? You ever thought about that? Just asking the question why we do what we do in Christianity and in church. So if you have a Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter what? Nice. Mateo capítulo 5. Was that right? No, not 5. What is it? Uh, 15. Right? 15. Did I get it? All right. Thank you. I appreciate you. Dude, I got to practice. We got a church now down in Lima, Peru. Necesito mucho practicar. Here we go. In Matthew chapter 15, we're going to start right in. But I started thinking about it as I was studying this passage, like, why am I so comfortable with change? Like, me personally, like, I love change. Some of you are like, of course you do do this traveling all the time. Like, but I just, I, there's something about change. It's invigorating to me. It's exciting to me. And I thought about it, and, and I thought about my life, and then it just kind of clicked. I was born in Lake Charles, Louisiana, uh, raging Cajun. I made me some jambalaya last night for dinner. Any Cajun food fans in the house? Whoa, way more than I expected. All right, Dutch people, I see you. Yeah, get some of that soul food from Nolens. Yeah, um, it's Nolens, not New Orleans, it's Nolens. Um, some of you still don't know what I'm saying. Um, but I was born in Louisiana, and at age like two, my family moved to Northwest Florida. And then from the age of like two and a half, three, till I was 18, we moved uh, six more times in the same city. And some of you are like, that's weird. Were y'all like on the run from the law? No, like... We were on a come up. Like my, my parents, you know, when you're a kid, you don't know that you're broke or you're poor. You're just like, this is the way the world is. And I look back and I was like, we were po. Like couldn't afford the O and the R. And, um, and, and, and my parents, like, you know, they, they, they saved and they both worked full-time jobs. And, and, and we lived in a house. And as soon as the kids could get old enough to work, we were free labor. That's what kids are. And we would, we would paint and we would work in the yard and we'd remodel the house. And then we'd sell it and upgrade a little bit and then sell it and upgrade. And we did that like seven times from the time I was zero to 18, all in the same city. And I remember when I went to college, I, I remember coming back like my junior year. And my best friend, his parents still lived in his childhood home. And I remember we had like a conversation and there was like this 10 seconds where I was a little jealous of that. Where I was like, oh man, it must be nice to come back to like your childhood bedroom and all the dishes are still. Like some of you, as I'm saying that, some of your parents still live in the home you grew up in. And when you go home, it's nice and nostalgic and, 
and your room's still the same way it was when you were five. I hope not. That's weird if that's the case. Like you're an adult now, turn it into a workout room or something. Anyway, but like, but I, w- I was a little jealous for like two seconds. And then I realized, no, I'm actually not jealous. Because what it taught me is home had nothing to do with the walls and the furniture and the objects in the house. Home was where my family was. There's that old saying, home is where the heart is. Somebody say heart. Heart. Home is where the the heart is. And I think this tension we face between old school and new school and what we see Jesus do in Matthew chapter 15 is take it right to the heart. Because the heart of the father has always been to welcome his children home. And so we're going to see what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 15, dealing with one of these traditions that the religious church people were trying to hold on to in CLG. And by the way, if you have time, I also wanted to cover Galatians chapter 5. It is a phenomenal passage where Paul addresses this same topic with a different, even more ancient tradition. But they said, I could not preach for two hours today. So we're just going to do Matthew 15. No one laughed at that. Okay, never going to preach two hours. Starts in verse 1. Oh, side note, I do got to point this out too. Um, I'm going to read this in the message translation. I address that because some of us are old school church people and as soon as I say the message translation, you like write me off. You're like even pharisaical about your translation of the Bible and I get it. Um, But some of you are unchurched or you don't go to church and you need to know there are different translations of the Bible. Um, The one that a lot of us kind of grew up reading was the King James Version. King James Version um, was, you know, not written by, but cultivated and curated by King James. That's why it gets the name. And and side note, it's actually a really good translation because he recruited translators and then he told them, as you're recruiting the Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic into King's English, into Old English, if you get one word wrong, we're going to have it checked by two, three to five translators. And if you get one word wrong, we're going to kill you, kill your family, and take everything from your family. How many of you would get it right? Right? So, like, the King James is actually a great translation, but it's in Old English. It has the these, the thous, the those, and all that stuff, so it's a little hard to read. So you got the NKJV, the New King James, which cleaned that up a little bit for us. But then you have the NIV. Anybody read NIV? Yeah, it stands for New International Version. NIV was translated from the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic phrase by phrase. That's why NIV tends to be a smooth read. It's kind of like sentence by sentence, idea by idea. Then you have the ESV. That's actually what I normally preach out of, the English Standard Version. Anybody read that one? A few of us? Okay. A few of the Reform crowd. That's for some reason a popular one there. But the, the ESV was translated from the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic word by word. And so it's a little rougher read than NIV, but it's more accurate if you're doing a word study in the Bible. Make sense? And then you have the message translation. The message translation was done like not too long ago, a couple decades ago. And the guy was like, hey, these are great, but I want to put it in like kind of a modern term. It's funny now because even some of his language is outdated. And so now there's like the message remix edition. My favorite Bible is the surfer's Bible. That's a cool Bible if you ever want to get it. It's like Jesus was surfing without a board. Um, It was great. That was a walking on water joke. Anyway, uh, it's not a good joke if you have to explain it. Um, But the message translation, I think sometimes it's so fun to read different translations because it helps you gain a better understanding of the idea. And I'm going to read from the paraphrase, the message translation, because I really like the way it says it. And it's pretty accurate to the story. So we're going to pick up in verse 1 and it reads, After that, Pharisees and religion scholars came to Jesus all the way from Jerusalem criticizing Jesus had people follow him just for the sake of criticizing him. And I know we're like, that sounds crazy. You know, some people follow people on social media just to criticize them. This still happens. Haters have existed for a long time. And this is fun to see how Jesus handled his haters. So why do your disciples, this is the haters, the religious Pharisees, questioning Jesus? Why do your disciples play fast and loose with the rules? But Jesus put it right back on them. Why do you use your rules to play fast and loose with God's commands? Jesus starting the smack talk. God clearly says, respect your father and mother, and anyone denouncing father or mother should be killed. But you weasel around that by saying, whoever wants to can say to their father and mother, what I owed you, I've given to God. That can hardly be called respecting a parent. You cancel God's commands by your rules. I'll say that again. You cancel God's commands by your rules. Frauds. 
Isaiah's prophecy of you hit the bullseye. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they're worshiping me, but they don't mean it. Mm. Tell us how you really feel, Jesus. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy. He then called the crowd together and said, listen and take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life or what you eat, but what you vomit up or what comes out of your mouth. Later, his disciples came and told him, did you know heaven will be pulled, oh, sorry, did you know how upset the Pharisees were when they heard what you said? Jesus shrugged it off. How do you handle your haters? Shrug it off. Every tree that wasn't planted by my Father in heaven will be pulled up by its roots. Forget them. They are blind men leading blind men. When a blind man leads a blind man, they will both end up in the ditch. And then Peter said, I still don't get it, Jesus. Put it in plain language. And then Jesus replied, you too? Are you being willfully stupid? I like the message translation. I do like it. Don't you know that anything that is swallowed works its way through the intestines and is finally defecated? But what comes out of the mouth gets its start in the heart. It's from the heart that we speak, that we vomit up evil arguments, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, lies, and cussing. That's what pollutes eating or not eating certain foods, washing or not washing your hands. That's neither here nor there. So the context Jesus' disciples stroll up to a meal, and they don't wash their hands, and they start eating. Some of you are like, gross. <laughs> it wasn't a question of sanitation. It was a question of tradition. Back in Exodus chapter 30, there was a tradition instituted. The rabbis, the priests, Jerusalem, Israel had a temple. And when the priests would approach the temple, they put these bowls outside with clean water in it. And the priest would dip their hands in the water and clean their hands as a symbol that before entering into God's presence, because he is holy, we must be made pure. The water did not make them pure. It was a symbol that they needed to be purified of the purification that would to come in the Savior before they entered God's presence. But here's the problem. The temple was destroyed. But the rabbis and the priests said, no, this is a good tradition. We need to keep this tradition. So they changed it from the temple and they said, okay, the table in your house is a temple and the food on your table is the offering, the sacrifice. So when you come to the table, so that way we remember God is holy and we need to be made pure to be able to enter into his presence. We're going to wash our hands before we sit down at the table and partake of the meal. That's where it came from. So here comes Jesus' disciples and they stroll up to the table and none of them homeboys use hand sanitizer. None of them bust out the dawn. None of them get the water. They just go right to eating. And the Pharisees freaked out. They were like, ah, you can't do that. And what would happen is people would come from the streets, hungry people, poor people, hurting people, and they would want to eat. And they, if they didn't know to wash their hands or they didn't know the right signals or they didn't know the right po protocol, they would be stiff-armed out of God's house and turn missing the heart of God himself. And Jesus came up on this scene and he said, oh, two things. First and foremost, Jesus and his blood on the cross is the one that purifies us. We don't need to wash our hands before every meal outside, again, of sanitation, guys. Back then they didn't. But like ceremonially, we don't have to do that. Second, he was saying, your rules are getting in the way of God's commands, and God's commands show God's heart. And what Jesus came to do was not to abolish the rules, not to abolish the commands, not to abolish the law. Jesus came to fulfill it, and he fulfilled all of it. And, and so as I'm reading this, some of you are like, cool, bro, but like we're not washing our hands before every meal at church. Like, like this isn't a thing anymore. How does this relate to us? And I wrote this, when tradition loses the heart, it stops leading people home. When a tradition loses its heart, it stops leading people home. Jesus had another term for this, if you read it in the New Testament. Jesus didn't play. The Pharisees were doing a similar thing and keeping people from God's house because of their rules. And he looked at the Pharisees and he said, you are whitewashed tombs. Whew. That's some trash talk. He said, you are whitewashed tombs. In other words, you look good on the outside, but on the inside, you are dead and empty. You wonder why they wanted to kill him. He didn't play. 
He said, stop trying to do all the right things on the outside. And meanwhile, your heart is wrong. And so then it begs the question, in modern day religion, in modern day Christianity, in modern day church, how are we doing with this? Like we got to check our hearts. Look at your neighbor and say, check your heart. Tell somebody, check your heart today. So you got to check your heart. Because we still do this in church. It may not be hand washing, but, but there's a lot of different ways in which we do this. I'll, I'll give you some, some fun examples. Um, like back in the day, there was this new technology that came to churches. And this new technology, people were really excited about it because it, it portrayed the message of the gospel in a new and exciting and colorful way. And when they brought it, this new technology into church, people in churches flipped out. They lost their minds. People actually left the church when this new technology came in and churches split. You know what the new technology was? Stained glass windows. When stained glass windows were introduced to churches, people were like, no, it's too artistic, it's too colorful, it's distracting. No, absolutely not. And people left churches and churches split because of the new technology of stained glass windows. And then you know what's crazy? Decades later, hundreds of years later, People tried to take stained glass windows out of churches, and guess what people did? They lost their minds again. They were like, no, it can't be a church building without stained glass. What are you doing? We're funny as humans, aren't we? And you know what's funny about old school and new school? Is everything that we consider old school was new school at one point. Everything we hold on to and like, ah, there's not a church without this. There was a time when that was controversial when it was introduced. By the way, you know what an LED screen is now? This is modern day stained glass. Like when people started bringing screens into church, people were like, no! It's just a modern technology to help portray the message of the gospel in an even more vibrant way. Amen? It's cool how if you like get open handed with that stuff, some of you are like, oh man, I don't care about stained glass. That one, that one don't mess, mess with me. Here's a fun one. By the way, as I preached this message, the whole first service, Pastor Craig was sitting right there, and I was looking at him out of the corner of my eye the entire message. Like, please don't fire me. Please don't fire me. Um, but here's a fun one. Y'all know like when, when, when the church was started in the book of Acts, like they didn't have like chairs and stuff. They just kind of gathered in whatever space they could. And then like somewhere around the Middle Ages, people were like, people need a place to sit. Let's make benches. And they were like, no. Nah, Let's call them pews. And so, so they brought benches into church so people could sit together and crowd together. And, and, and you'll never believe this, but like uh, what we found is people spread out on pews. That's why some of you like it. You're like, yeah, you know, you can spread out. And that's cool. But then as churches grew, what we found is you could actually fit more people if you put chairs in because then people come together. And then more people can be reached and, and welcomed home in the heart of God. So some logic thinking churches were like, oh, let's, let's take out the benches where people spread out and let's put in pews. And you'll never guess what people did. They lost their minds. People have left churches because of a bench. Thank you one ma'am that found that funny. The rest of us were like, can I laugh at that? Are they going to move the bench? No, no, we have plenty of space here. I hope and pray to God one day we don't have enough space in here on these pews. I really, amen, right? But like, it's funny all of a sudden, we're like, hand washing, ah, stained glass, ah, ah, bitch. Here's a more modern one that, that's fun. I can keep going. I have like a whole back pocket full of these. These are fun. Uh, I was the interim lead pastor for a church here in Michigan for a little over a year. Anybody grow up in a small church? Anybody grow up in a small church, right? You, you remember, I, I grew up in a church that would do this. And this church still had it going on. Um, the whole family would come in and worship, right? The whole family, your kids would come in with you. And then after the last worship song, they would call all the kids to the front. Anybody remember that? And all the kids would sing a song. And you'd be like, oh, little Bobby and his suspenders. It was cute. It was awesome. It was fun. It was good. And then Sunday school teacher would come up and they'd escort them all out to a Sunday school, right? Now, as I say that, if you grew up in church, you're like, good old days. That's nice. If you didn't grow up in church and you heard me say that, you're like, what did you do with those children? That is shocking. Why? Because two reasons. One, if, if the church grows, you, a, a healthy kids ministry is about 10 to 20 percent of your adult population. That's 10 to 20 percent of the seats you're filling up for a third of the service only to then leave them vacant. So if you rather started with kids ministry, you could reach more people. Like, again, logic, math. Some of you are like, stop doing math. This is church. But then, 
But then the other thing, I was like, imagine if you're a first-time guest. Imagine you're a single mom and you have your two, three kids and you're like, for some reason you're searching and you're like, I'm going to give this God thing a try. And you go and you just pick a church. You know how much courage it takes to check out a new church? And, 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 and you don't know how your kids to dress and you don't know. And you finally, and you wrangle them and then you get them in there. And then you sit down at this church and then they're singing these songs and you don't know the words to them. And you don't understand anything. And then finally you sit down and you're like, Phew. And then they're like, all the children come to the front. And then your kids are like, mom, do we have to go? I don't want to go. And now you've incited an argument with this thing. I don't know. I guess you're supposed to go. What are they going to do? And then maybe the kids are extroverted and they, they're a little brave. And then they come up to the front and then they sing a song. And these guests' children don't know the words. So you've just put a spotlight on them in front of all these adults they don't know. And then two or three strangers come up and escort your child out of the building to God knows where to do God knows what. That's terrifying as a parent. Imagine how ostracized and awkward that feels. But all of a sudden, because we're used to it, we, for, we can forget that sometimes our traditions can get in the way of the heart of welcoming people home. I got another one. <laughs> no, no, here's, I'll address this one. And then we'll, we'll stop with these. Like, you ever ask the question, where did the concept of dressing up for church come from? You know that wasn't biblical. <laughs> Vipka, it's quiet. Oh, that got quiet when I said that. Like when they, in Acts in the new church, they'd be at work and then they'd go to church. Like people would just show as come as you are, share what you need. Later, as church got more organized in rural areas, it was really the only time of the week you would see other people in your town. Because you'd be farming Monday through Saturday or doing what you had to do to make your family survive. And then so people would get dressed up. They would, out of respect for other people, they would want to put on their Sunday best. That's where that came from. And then when I was raised, it was communicated to me like this. Uh, Corey, if you were invited to the White House to meet the president, how would you dress? Out of respect for the office, you'd put on a suit. I would. I think it's nice. I think it's a good thing to do. And they said, how much more if you come to God's house out of respect? If you address that way for the president, should you for God? That's how I was taught when I was a kid. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, I get it. But then as I got older and I started inviting, you know the number one reason people say they don't go to church? Number one reason, statistics tell us, because they don't know what to wear. I'm afraid I'll wear the wrong thing. Because we've all strolled up into that event or that church or that place and we felt like I didn't get the memo, I didn't get the dress code. And I found it, like in high school and college, what I, what I found is if I invited my friends to my traditional Baptist church, they would walk in and because they weren't in a suit and tie, because they weren't, they would feel awkward. They would feel, I, I remember one time in, in my junior year of high school, I was leading worship with a touring worship band. And we played this Christian festival up in Ohio. And there was a pastor there and he invited us to lead worship for his church the next morning on Sunday morning. And we said, sure. So we got a hotel for the night and we showed up the next morning. All we had were our festival clothes. And, and so it's like jeans and t-shirts and stuff. And we show up. And I'll never forget this. Um, I was leaving the bathroom. I just washed my hands. And I was leaving the bathroom and this deacon walked in. And I know he was a deacon because that's how he introduced himself. And, and he was in a three-piece suit. And he looked at my buddy Jesse. And, and Jesse was washing his hands. And this is, he said, I said, hey, how you doing, sir? He said, hey, I'm Deacon Bob. I said, nice to meet you. I'm Corey. And I go to leave. And he looked at Jesse. And he goes, what you got on your feet there, boy? And Jesse looked down and he said, my flip-flops? And he said, I know you ain't going to come back to church dressed and disrespectful like that. You need to make sure next time you come back here you're dressed right. And I remember I heard that. You know what I did? I went and put on my flip-flops because I was young and rebellious. But what this deacon didn't know is we were the worship leaders for that Sunday. And so the pastor got up and prayed and welcomed us up. And me and Jesse stroll up on that platform in flip-flops. And he about had a heart attack. Because we were dressed like Jesus in his sandals. <laughs> but here's my point. You want to dress up for church? If that is a way that you honor God, that's beautiful. That's amazing. But at a point... If it ever gets to the point where someone is coming in and they need to be welcomed home and they're in shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops, if our dress code ever acts as a stiff arm to people, we got to let go of a tradition. 
Because God's heart is to welcome people home no matter what background they come from. And a dress code for church isn't even biblical. Literally, the Bible says, come as you are. By the way, we have a traditional 909 service. And after I preached this first service, I ran to the 909 service. And I was like, do you all still love me? And they were like, we love you. And I was like, okay, we're good. <laughs> because, again, it's, it's, it's not about the do's and don'ts. It's about your heart. Somebody say heart. heart. But, but let me be re real clear on this. This is not an old person problem. This is not an older generation problem. First off, let me just speak to like the millennials, Gen X, Gen Z for a second. These older generations have been through more change than most of us can even fathom. Y'all know that, right? Like I think of my great grandmother, Mama Simon. She was born January 1st, 1900, lived to 1999. She, she lived to be 99 years old. And it was great because you always knew how old she was. Because when it was 1948, she was 48. When it was 1972, she was 72. It was real easy. But I thought about my great-grandmother. And did y'all know only half the homes in the United States had electricity in 1925? She grew up in backwoods, swampland, Gaydon, Louisiana. You wanted chicken for dinner, you went out back and rang one's neck. Sorry, vegetarians, that's just the way it was. If you wanted to eat, if you wanted to get somewhere, you took the horse or you walked. In her lifetime, she saw the invention and the distribution of electricity. She saw the automobile be spread across the In her lifetime, she saw the invention of all the, she saw the invention of the automobile and then men walk on the moon. How insane. She saw the invention of the telephone. Anybody have grandparents old enough to remember when you would pick up the phone and an operator would answer and then they would physically take a cable out and connect you to another person y'all know what I'm talking about some of you are like yeah I still got that phone Holland's old school right now like and then there was like rotary phones and then there were corded phones and then there were cordless house phones and then there were car phones and then there was the Zach Morris brick phone and then there's the cell phone she saw all of that our baby boom generation and the generations before, you guys have seen more change than we can have fathom. You know what I found as a younger person? Older generations don't mind change. They just want to know why we're changing. And if you have a good why, they'll get on board. But a lot of times, us younger generations, we forget to sit down and have the conversation. And just go, hey, here's what we're thinking. Here's where this is going. And what I've usually found is people will go, yeah, let's do it. Let's rock on. Older generations have been through so many hard times that one of my favorite quotes from Michael Hoff is, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak, weak men, and weak men create hard times. But I wrote in my notes, this is why we need tradition. Tradition helps us in hard times and keeps us strong in good times. Sometimes we need some old school. Some of y'all didn't expect the younger communicator to be advocating for old school. But sometimes we need some old school, guys. Sometimes when you're sick and you've tried all the medicine and you're in the hospital and you've had the operation and you still ain't getting better, sometimes we need some old school. Sometimes we need that old school. Sometimes we got to get on the phone. You call the elders of the church. They come down to that hospital room. They do that old school biblical thing and take out that anointing oil and they put it on your head and they lay hands on you. That's, that's not charismatic. That is biblical old school tradition. And you know what I've seen? I've seen people get healed because of the faith of some elders in the church. Sometimes you need some old school. Some of us younger families, you've had that baby that won't stop crying. And you tried the new school, you tried the iPad, you tried the mechanical swing, you drove them around in the car for hours and that baby won't stop crying. Sometimes we need some old school. We need to call the grandmamas in the church and say, this baby won't stop, will you help me? And they show up and they say, oh child, it's okay. They just need to feel your heartbeat. They need you to dance with them. They'll teach you some of those old ways. Sometimes we need some old school church. I get emotional because it just makes me think of like my grandparents and how grateful I am for how they taught us. I think I was down in Jamaica, and uh, one time I got real sick before I was supposed to preach. Head was like splitting and, and runny nose, and I took all the medicine. I took Mucinex, Tylenol, like Advil. I would, took it all. That's probably why I was messed up. But I, just, I took all this medicine. I was still feeling awful, and I never forget Miss June. 
Miss June was like a helper in one of our family's houses, and she's an older Jamaican woman. And Miss June said, I'll fix you up, Pastor Corey. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, don't worry. And, and she went to the woods and got a root from this old Jamaican tree, and then she put it in a pot, and then she threw in some other herbs and spices, and she said, you're going to drink the root. And I was like, I'm going to do what? And she was like, it's an old school Jamaican remedy. But at that point, I was hurting so bad, man, I drank that within an hour. Headache gone, nose was cleared up. I was like, Miss June, we're going into business. Like, this stuff works. And she says, no, that's an old school Jamaica remedy. Sometimes we need some old school, right? I, I want you all to hear my heart on this. This isn't an indictment on any specific generation. I think younger generations, man, if we will look to the older generations and, and, and sit down. I didn't get to say this in the first service, but like, if you're in your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 100, like, we need you so much. Like, us in our 30s and 20s and teens, we need you more than you know. We need you to have coffees with us. We need you to have a breakfast with us. We need to hear your stories. We need to hear all of your mistakes. So we don't have to make them. That's wisdom, learning from other people's mistakes so you don't have to make them yourself. But can I also say this, young people, we need you. You are not the leaders of tomorrow. You are the leaders of today. I was so thrilled to see one of our high school students up here leading worship this morning. We need the old school and the new school. We need us all to embrace the heart of the Father and welcome people home. And when we do what the creative piece did, when we come together, oh, it is beautiful. I wrote in my notes, good traditions don't get in the way of reaching people. Good traditions remind us of the heart. Good traditions remind us we're home. It reminds me a, a few weeks ago, I was in Nigeria. I told you guys that um, we support Amazing pastor, shout out Pastor David and your family over there just outside of Lagos, Nigeria. If you haven't heard Pastor David's story, I don't have time to tell it, but it will wreck you in an amazing way. But I finally, after waiting through COVID, couldn't get over there. I mean, just getting a visa to go to Nigeria was an, an insane process. But get over there, land in Lagos. Uh, he's in Ibadan, which is about three hours outside of Lagos. And go spend about four days with him and his family and see the churches that we're supporting there. And I, saw, I got to see the school and sit in the classroom with the kids that can't afford education. The church there is giving them education. That's because of you guys. Thank you. When you give, like Lynn was saying, you're changing lives in Holland and changing lives around the world in Ibadan, Nigeria. And I sat there with these kids and I had a great time and it was amazing. But can I just say this, like, I've been to some of the hardest, like roughest, most impoverished places in the world. And, and Nigeria was no exception to that. It was rough. Some of you follow me on Instagram, you saw the roads just to get to church. Roads is the generous term. And uh, on my last day there, I woke up and I travel so much, I kind of have a system. I have the things that go where they're supposed to go. And I woke up at 6 a.m. David was going to pick me up at 8 a.m. We were going to go check out some things in Lagos. Then my flight was at 8 p.m. that night. And I was supposed to go to Europe to connect with some churches there and then make my way back here. And uh, I wake up and I can't find my passport. My passport's gone. Now, I know I had it. I knew where it was in my backpack, and it was gone. Somebody had taken it. And if you travel a lot and you know that feeling, you can't find your passport, it's like the world stops. <laughs> You're just like, no! You're like, I can't get home! I love Nigeria, I love David, but I was like, I'm stuck in Nigeria! And so I called, I called David and I'm like, yo man, we gotta get to the U.S. Embassy stat. Like, cause I've just traveled enough to know once that sucker's gone, it's gone. It's been sold, it's, it's not, I'm not getting it back. So they call the police chief, they're interviewing people. I'm like, dude, I just got to go. We got to get it to the embassy. And so I'm calling and I'm calling and I'm calling the embassy. And finally I get somebody on the phone and they're like, hey, no passports can be issued without an appointment. You got to make an appointment. And I was like, well, give me the website. I'll make an appointment. He gives me the website. I hang up the call. I pull up the website. The next available appointment was October 22nd. This was a few weeks ago. I was like, no, 
I, the, the policy, the procedure, the guideline, the tradition was I needed to fill that out, and I was not accepting that. So I called, and I called, and I called again, and I went through one Nigerian and another. And finally, I got somebody on the phone that sounded like they were from America, and I was like, yo, here's the deal, man. I, and I explained my situation, and he goes, yeah, you need an appointment. I said, the next appointment's not until October 22nd. I need a passport today, man. And he was just like, what time can you get here? And I was like, 12, knowing it was probably going to be more like 2. Um, and he goes, get here as soon as you can. We close at 4. I'm not promising you anything. And he went and hang up the phone, and I was like, hey, what's your name? And he said, Shaw. And I was like, got it, Agent Shaw. I learned a long time ago, name dropping opens a lot of doors. Some of you laugh. That's how we get into heaven. I know Jesus. God's like, come on in. Um, name drop, it works. No, you got to have a relationship. But, um. I get, we, it takes like four and a half hours to get to the embassy. It's almost two o'clock. We pull up and there's guards and stuff. By the grace of God, there's only two families in front of me in this line. And I go through the barricades and, I, and I'm waiting in the line and I get to the front of the line. And the guard with the AK-47 says, what are you here for? I said, a passport. He said, do you have an appointment? I said, no. He said, you can't have a passport. And I said, I know Agent Shaw. And he goes, you know Shaw? I was like, yes, sure. And he was like, okay, wait here. They go inside, he comes back out, and he said, uh, hey, I need your ID. Do you have ID? And I pulled out my driver's license, keep it on my phone. I, I pulled it out, and I went like this, and he, and he stuck out his hand to take my, my driver's license. And I went, I said, no offense, sir, um, but this is the only ID I have left. Would you mind, if, can I stay with it? Can I walk with you in there? And he said, that's not the way it works. That's not the policy. We have to check your identification before we let you in. I said, sir, I'm sorry. I just feel really uncomfortable letting go of this. Can any of you guys relate? Like I was just, I already lost my passport. It's not you, it's me, but like, ugh. And he was really upset. He reminded me of that Deacon Bob. And he went, and he went back in. And then a different man came out. And he wasn't dressed in fatigue, he's all formal. He was just in slacks and a polo. And he came out and he smiled at me. He said, Mr. Castle? I said, yes, sir. He introduced himself. And he said, we, we do have to check your ID to, to let you in. And I said, sir, I understand, but this is my last one. And, and he goes, I understand. He goes, you were taken advantage of. It makes sense why you wouldn't trust us. And then he said this. He said, but you're home now. This embassy, this is your home. You're safe here. It's going to be okay. And it was a visceral experience. I could feel it my whole body. It's like my shoulders relaxed. I breathed a little softer and, and I handed him my driver's license. And he said, thank you, I'll be right back. And he was kind. He was understanding. And within a minute, he came right back out. He's like, Mr. Castle, come back on in. And then he explained the situation. He's like, look, we have these rules. We have these regulations. We have these policies, guidelines, and traditions that must be abided by. But the whole point of this embassy is to take care of American citizens and to represent America. And that's who you are. And so we're going to do whatever we can. We're going to put aside any policies and guidelines to try and help you. But pray that our printers can work. And so I filled out some paperwork. They were like, can you fill this out as fast as you can? I'm filling it out. And then they were like, do you have a passport photo? I was like, who carries around a passport photo? And I had one in my bag because I accidentally got two when I got my Nigerian visa. I just happened to have one. And then they said, do you have $160 cash? And I never carry cash, Lynn, ever, because I'm a millennial and we only use card. <laughs> but I had $180 cash that I brought with me as just what if money. And, and I was like, I have both the things I need. And I gave it to him. And he was like, pray, pray, pray. And within an hour and 45, I was calling everybody, pray, 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 pray. And with an hour and 45 minutes, I got a new temporary passport. And I was able to make it home. And I remember I was just praying. And I was like, God, why did you let that happen to me? And I felt so clearly in my spirit. He just said, that's the way church is supposed to be. Heaven is our home. And the Bible says, not a building, but when God's people come together as the church, in the Bible, it, it, it's said in the Greek that it's where heaven meets earth. This is an embassy for heaven. 
And when hurting people, broken people come into our doors, it's our job to look at them and say, hey, I know you're suspicious. I know people have hurt you. I know the world has taken advantage of you, but you're safe here. You're home. It's gonna be okay. And then we get to give them that eternal passport that is a relationship with Jesus. And then we go and be ambassadors. And any policy or regulation or tradition that we have, as good as it is, if it ever gets in the way of welcoming people home, throw it away. Because the heart of the Father is to welcome all the children home. Amen. And Jesus, some of you are like, throw all traditions away. There's good traditions in the Bible. The Bible says don't neglect gathering together. That's why we do this. Keep coming together. Don't do life alone. Life is better together, better connected. We worship, we sing. Why? Because it's a biblical tradition that we hold on to that God encourages us to do. But Jesus only instituted two traditions. In Jesus' entire ministry recorded in the gospel, there's only two things he said we should keep doing. The first one he modeled for us himself was baptism. Jesus got baptized, and then what did he say? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. That's why we still do baptism, because Jesus said to do it. And if Jesus said to do it, we do it. Amen? But that was one out of the two. That's why we have baptism coming up. If you need to do that, that's your move today. But the other tradition Jesus instituted, he took an old one, an ancient one, and he reclaimed it, redeemed it, and represented it for the glory of God and the good of his people, focusing it on welcoming people home, getting their hearts in the right place. They were gathered around a table for Passover dinner. And Jesus took this tradition and he pointed it to the heart, him. And he said, whenever you come together and you eat and drink, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. I want you to remember the heart of the Father is that he loves you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for you. And it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what you're wearing, what's going on in your life, or what you've done. If you believe in Jesus, then you take of it in remembrance of him. And so today we just wanted to finish out our time by doing one of the traditions that we still hold on to. And as we do this, can I just ask this of you guys? Can we let communion today be a heart check for us? If you're leaning more towards the old school and there's some traditions that you really like, there's a style of music that you love, there's an aesthetic that really appeals to you, could I ask you today to just let Jesus check your heart? And maybe let him tell you if, you're, if you or I are being a little pharisaical and we're holding on to rules and traditions more than we are to the heart of the gospel and welcoming people home. If you're younger in here today or maybe you trend that way, can I just ask you as you take communion to let Jesus check your heart? And if you've been disrespectful or flippant towards the traditions of the past, maybe today you could go, hey, God, what do I need to learn? What should I re-engage with and hold on to? And can we as a church just commit to never holding on to our traditions more than we do to the heart of the gospel? Y'all cool with that? Can I get an amen on that? So Jesus gathered his disciples around and, and he took the bread and he held it up and he said, hey, from now on when you take this, I want you to remember that my body is broken for you. And so when you eat it, I want you to remember my heart for you. And then he ate of the bread and so you and I can partake of the bread and remember his body broken for us. And then Jesus held up the wine. See, we even change communion. They use wine, we, we use juice. Because it's not about the items, it's about the heart. But he held up the wine and he said, hey, when you drink this, 
want you to remember my blood was spilled for you. And you don't have to wash your hands to come into my presence. My blood is what makes you pure and righteous. So every time you come together and drink it, just remember my heart for you. You may take of the cup. And I thought it only fitting that we end our time together singing that old school hymn that we heard earlier. Amazing grace. It's amazing that God has given his church so much grace as we have fought over the dumbest things throughout the generations. But God gives us grace on top of grace on top of grace. But I asked the band if we could finish the song with a verse that I don't normally hear. But it's in the original song and it goes like this. Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. This grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. Father, I'm so grateful that we have a home in you. Thank you for your patience with your church. And God, right now, I just pray over Central as we're kind of a beacon for this whole Water's Edge family of churches leading the way in so many different avenues. God, I just pray that our heart will look like yours. God, I pray that you would give our leaders and all the people under the sound of my voice just the wisdom to know what we're holding on to that we need to let go of and to hold fast to all that you're calling us to hold on to. But God, I pray that this will always be a safe place for people to receive your grace and be welcomed home. It's in your name we worship.
If you are someone who is hopeful to take that next step in baptism, we are hosting a baptism meeting today in the lobby. Look for a banner and a group of friendly people who are there to help you figure out what that next step looks like. And we look forward to celebrating with those who are taking that next step on October 23. Be blessed this week and we'll see you next Sunday.